Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Cahill, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I think I had a lot of notice yesterday. I was asked to give the talk, so uh, thanks very much. Um, I suppose just to kind of indicate that, you know, I would not make a very good clinician. First of all, I don't get up very early. I'm, I'm quite unhappy when I get up very early. Uh, but also, um, I actually remember I went for an interview for, uh, when I finished uh, my degree in biochemistry in UCD, I went for an interview in the College of Surgeons to do medicine. And you know, in those days, they'd ask you, you know, what are you going to do? Why do you want to study medicine? And then one of the questions I had, which was the killer question, was they asked me a question, what was the last book I read? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a traditional question. And at the time, I, had, uh, I, saw, I told them, a clockwork orange, and then the interview was over. So, um, so I'm just going to give you a kind of uh, kind of three-part presentation. The first is uh, just a brief introduction to Conway Institute. Then I'm going to talk about a program called Breast Predict, which is funded by the Irish Cancer Society, which I direct, which is a kind of nationwide program focused on uh, breast cancer. And then touch a, a bit about what we do within my lab. And so uh, just in April, I took over the uh, directorship of this building here called the Conway Institute. So this is an institute really focused on translational research around chronic diseases. Um, and again, it's, uh, we have uh, academic, both basic scientists, translational scientists, and clinici clinician scientists embedded within the institute, both physically, but also you don't have to be physically situated in the Conway. We, but half the PIs are actually outside the Conway. Uh, I also have a kind of commercial affiliation, but I, I, I might mention that a little bit later on, called Oncomark. And so I use this kind of picture really to represent what, I suppose, my vision of what we term translational research. And there's different definitions of that, but, you know, we have this concept of blue skies or kind of discovery research. And so a lot of that, a lot of that uh, is really kind of very far removed from, from clinical implementation or practical reality, which is here. And when we talk about translational research, it's actually quite a challenging thing to do, which is to actually take some of these basic concepts and actually sort out which ones are actually useful. But also importantly, not always consider this direction, going from basic to, to, cl uh, to clinic, but actually do basic research which is informed based on clinical need. And I think that's something that we also need to consider. You know, a lot of research that's out there is quite peripheral to, to clinical need. So it's always important to have this dialogue between uh, uh, both basic scientists and, and clinicians. And so the institute is a, it's set up in a way that it's interdisciplinary. So we have people working across different disease areas. We are quite keen on people from different backgrounds. So for example, chemists, biologists, people from clinical backgrounds, from basic science. We're really interested in the convergence between computational approaches and wet lab approaches, which is kind of the big area at the moment. And I suppose we have two, two, two ideas is can we explore underpinning mechanisms uh, uh, underlying these chronic diseases and then start to utilize that in terms of developing new diagnostic or uh, therapeutic solutions. And so if you look at the kind of areas that we're kind of, we have a, a kind of a cluster of people working on, uh, we have an activity in oncology, uh, we have a, a variety of uh, researchers looking at cardiovascular and metabolic disease like, uh, for example, uh, Carl LaRue and uh, Catherine Godson. Uh, inf inf inflammation and autoimmunity, and respiratory disease and neuroscience. So we have essentially 90 investigators working across these different areas, approximately about 450 uh, uh, researchers of PhD students, postdocs, uh, 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 research fellows of different types working on these particular programs. And so if you look at the last five years, we've published over 2,500 papers, including some very high profile ones in New England Journal, uh, Nature, Science, Cell. We have a, a good citation record. We have a good funding record, over 100 million over the last five, uh, five years. Uh, and then we've had just a couple of highlights more recently. We've launched this uh, precision medicine facility. So the idea is that, particularly in the cancer space, there's a big interest in identifying the specific mutations which are driving particular types of cancer and then using that information to actually use specific targeted agents against those driver mutations. And so, uh, really, things are shifting towards uh, uh, an individual when they, when they come in, they will actually get a full personalized genome, which every single cancer that presents at a molecular level is different. We, we know that for, uh, 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 in that context. And can we actually develop particular therapeutics to actually target that, those driver mutations? And for that, we need a sophisticated, uh, a kind of, I suppose, system 
from the kind of molecular diagnostic lab, which carries very specific mutational analysis to more discovery-based work. And so that's what we've launched here, uh, uh, this precision medicine facility where we can actually do advanced next generation sequencing on particularly tumor samples. I'm going to talk a bit about breast predict in a minute. And again, as I mentioned, we have 90 PIs, 45 in the building and, and 45 outside, and we're always looking for people who are interested in engaging uh, with the Institute. So as uh, Professor Cal indicated, you know, I'm particularly interested in this, and I think for us to actually take novel discoveries and actually bring them to the clinic, we need to closely engage with the industry to actually deliver that. And so we have a very good, healthy ecosystem in terms of ongoing interactions with industry. And actually embedded within the institute itself, we actually have uh, companies. And, and one of the kind of newer people on the, on the on, uh, we just launched um, with an, a, a fairly impressive funding round of 50 million uh, a couple of weeks ago, Genomics Medicine Ireland. They have a fairly ambitious objective of pretty much sequencing a, a fairly large component of the Irish uh, genome. So the institute structure is such that we have these kind of research questions, we have PIs, but part of the reason of having a research institute is that you have core technologies that people within the institute, but also importantly externally from the institute, can actually use to actually carry out specific functions. So for example, we have dedicated expert technical staff that anybody within UCD and the affiliated hospitals can use at the same cost as everybody else. And we have genomics platforms, proteomics, we have advanced imaging, flow cytometry, we have a research pathology core. And again, we, uh, uh, we encourage people to use these facilities. One other area that we're quite strong on is model systems. So we have uh, a variety of different model systems of different complexity. Our lab, uh, what, what we do within our particular lab was we actually have a fairly uh, good system for doing studies in small animals and associated with imaging uh, uh, studies. So that's a Conway. I was going to spend a co couple of minutes talking about Breast Predict. And so Breast Predict was uh, essentially funded by the Irish Cancer Society three years ago. It was the first of a new type of program. Classically, the Irish Cancer Society used to fund small project grants and maybe uh, something up to about a million euro, for example, the Prostate Cancer Research Consortium, slightly large scale program. And this was uh, essentially a vision of actually uh, uh, John Fitzpatrick, who was based prim obviously primarily uh, uh, in the matter here, the late John Fitzpatrick. And he had a vision of really, I suppose, for people not to reinvent the wheel, not to have these kind of competitive silos and different groups, really people collectively come together in, in a specific area and work together. And so the idea was there was a kind of call for any particular, so you, you had to bid for a program, a, a collaborative, what was termed a collaborative cancer research center. And the idea is that you had to actually uh, have three components. You had to have, a, what we, again, this term of translational research, but also importantly, you had to have a strong clinical element. So, for example, have clinical trials built into it, but also an aspect of population-based research. And so we bidded for that program at that time. We were successful. We were the first uh, collaborative cancer research center to, to be funded. And so we, got, uh, we have received funding of 7.5 million euro over five years, 1.5 million uh, per year. Um, and we have five key goals. The first is really to take on board some very good prior work done by um, uh, Professor Arnold Hill and Leonie Young in the College of Surgeons, also Michael Kern in Galway, and others, other, other uh, 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 surgical colleagues who actually have developed biobanks, putative biobanks in the breast cancer space. And what we did is we provided some additional funding to underpin that. And then we have five research oriented questions. One very interesting question is, what is the impact of prior population-based drug exposures, particularly aspirins and statins, on the type of breast cancer that women present with? And so there's some very interesting data suggesting that women who take low-dose aspirin prior to their breast cancer diagnosis, when they present with breast cancer, tend to have le less aggressive disease. So to, for us to actually make any recommendations, you need to actually follow this up in some way. So we're following this up at a broader population-based level, but also mechanistically using model systems. A big interest out there in the cancer community is You've got these fantastic new targeted drugs, but commonly you get resistance evolving to treatment. And so can we understand how that happens and try to overcome that? One other area that we're quite interested in is, you know, rather than empirically just taking two drugs and you know, saying, oh yeah, let's combine them together and see, see what works, is to upfront decide using computational approaches, what are the best combination approaches to use, and then go ahead and test these. And so this is work, work led by Walter Kolsch and John Crown. And then we have a, a diagnostic work package. I'll give you an example on, uh, of that. 
And so this program involves, it's led out of UCD by myself, and involves six academic institutions dotted around Ireland, but also importantly, Cancer Trials Ireland, which kind of unites the clinical trials activity within Ireland. And so this funds a team of 50 people, uh, not only the classic PhD student and postdoc, but importantly, the people with uh, uh, research nurses that facilitate biological collection. Particularly, we're interested in, which is very challenging, is getting access to the metastatic lesion. Uh, obviously, for us to be able to fully study what happens from a primary tumor to a metastatic lesion, you need to be able to go in and sample the metastatic lesion. And so that, that's obviously very challenging, and you need to resource that from an infrastructural level. And so we have embedded people within ICORG to facilitate this uh, process also. And so what we've achieved over the last three years, so we've been quite productive. We've published over 50 articles of varying quality. Importantly, we've uh, helped in terms of enrollment, in terms of uh, ongoing clinical trials in Cancer Trials Ireland, up to 2,000 patients. And also, we've generated some additional funding, being able to leverage some additional funding. And I'll give you some examples of that. One, uh, unashamedly, from our group, but uh, just to give you a, just a, a snippet. So this is from a, a collaboration with Adrian Bracken in Trinity College. Adrian is a fantastic basic scientist who understands the kind of intricacies of how cells age. And he, he came up with this very interesting concept is that uh, 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 Mark, uh, Mr. Stokes would actually understand this quite well in terms of the breast cancer space. We have these gene expression signatures which are actually being used in the clinic to determine whether a woman should get chemotherapy or not, early stage breast cancer. The problem is that the actual currently used tool, Oncotype DX, is actually not great in the sense that it identifies patients as low, intermediate, and high risk of distant recurrence. Low risk, you can suggest, potentially suggest not to get chemo, but with intermediate and high risk, we don't know what to do with those women. And so what we did is we actually took the various different gene expression signatures which are out there on them and uh, uh, published, and we essentially reverse engineered those. We actually looked, if you look at all those various different signatures, they're, they're non-overlapping in terms of the genes. So we reverse engineered those using a computational approach and came up with a new signature of kind of master regulators. And that's indicated here, where you have these red dots indicate six genes which kind of coordinately regulate a central core of genes. And when we look at these six genes on their own, we can actually subdivide. This is a cohort of patients from Sweden where we have long-term follow-up data. We can categorize women into essentially two groups, low and high risk. And importantly, we capture a big proportion of those women. We know that the ground truth is that women with early stage breast cancer, particularly ER positive breast cancer, at least two thirds of those have an inherent low risk of the disease spreading. And so we capture pretty much that two thirds using that assay. And what's important is that it has a fairly high degree of accuracy. So it was only 3% of patients uh, displayed a distant metastasis after 10 years. And no, no patient experienced a distant metastasis after five years when they were identified as low risk. So that's using a, essentially a multi-gene assay, a QRT-PCR assay of seven genes. And so we've got, we licensed that into this company which I set up, Oncomark, and we were able to use that uh, as a, uh, a vehicle to actually get some additional funding from the EU and VC money to actually bring this now in about a, about a two year time frame to the clinic. And more recently, we got some funding to actually look at this at the protein level as well from SFI. And so Bill, Professor Watson was here last week, and so this is a grant myself and Bill have just got funding for, which is on one level, this kind of clinical decision paradigm of low and high risk, and we're actually looking at this signature at the protein level. And obviously Bill presented this work, I suppose last week, looking at a serum signature at, at the prostate cancer level. So, so Professor Cal will know this chap here on the right hand side, or left hand side, Professor Don Shea, I'm sure if he's sp has spoken here, Donald is a very clever uh, organic chemist. He worked in Kodak, and I, I had worked, collaborated with, with Donald for, for over a decade before he went to the College of Surgeons. And we had worked on these quite interesting compounds that he had actually developed, which are actually fluorescent compounds, which also have therapeutic pro properties. And there's a big interest at the moment uh, for, for example, developing of imaging tools that can be used for intraoperative imaging. So maybe, for example, to pick up residual cancer material that can be used for, uh, uh, during live uh, uh, surgery. One of the limitations at the moment with these most fluorescent compounds is that they're already inherently fluorescent. So if you put them into either an animal or a human, they'll already fluoresce. 
So what Donal has developed is essentially a very sophisticated uh, compounds which only turn on when they're actually inserted into cells, when they're actually taken up by cells. So they're essentially blank, and when they're inserted into cells, they turn on like a switch. And so that's indicated here. They're, out, they're off, they're, they have no fluorescence outside cells, and then once they're taken up inside cells, they actually become fluorescent. And so what we did is we actually showed that these compounds work in an animal model context. And I think uh, Donald is now working with Professor Cal to, to try to bring this closer now to the clinic. This study got a bit of attention. I was on the front cover of Irish Independent this, 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 this on Monday, and uh, I was bizarrely interviewed uh, on, uh, yesterday by the RTE, and I actually, I look so old, that's the problem. When you look at yourself in, on TV, you kind of say, Jesus Christ, fat and old. And, uh, I, and it was kind of interesting. It's quite a simple study, in a sense, essentially just on cell lines, right? But what was shown, so this is work from Joe Duffy and John Crown and his, uh, their PhD student, Nisha Sinnott. And so we know, for example, there's one particular subgroup of breast cancers which are difficult to treat, triple negative breast cancer. These are uh, tumors which are devoid of expression of HER2 and the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. So you can't give them hormone therapy and you can't give them uh, Herceptin or HER2 targeted drugs. So you pretty much, only, only, only other choice is chemotherapy, which is pretty piss poor, okay? Now the whole idea is, the holy grail in the field is to find a specific drug that would work preferentially in triple negative breast cancer. And one, one particular abnormality, which is very common in triple negative breast cancer, is a mutation of this gene called P53. It's the most commonly mutated gene in, uh, in cancer. I did my PhD on it many, many years ago, and I started my research career in P53. But what was interesting is that only recently people have actually developed drugs which can actually take a mutant version of P53 that's essentially dysregulated in, in cancer and turn it back into a correct form or a wild type form. And so, uh, uh, from a company in Sweden called Aprea. So they actually developed a drug uh, called APR246 or PrimaMet. There's various different names for it. And they've been shown utility in both phase one and now there's some efficacy studies ongoing in, in uh, uh, ser high-grade serous ovarian cancer for this drug. And a simple question that Joe's group asked was, does this dr drug work in, in breast cancer? And particularly in the context of triple negative breast cancer, and it does. So you get striking effects with this drug, but also importantly, you get additive value beyond chemo. So the next logical stage is now, because this drug is shown to be safe in, in humans, you just do a clinical trial in a specific breast cancer context. So that we're hoping to do that in the next couple of years. And in the interest of time, I'll skip over this. This is a study from Brian Hennessy, a medical oncologist in the College of Surgeons, where he essentially took cell line data and bypassed the in vivo studies and went directly to a clinical trial based on purely cell line data alone. It's an ongoing clinical trial called PANTHER. And the last minute or two, I'm just going to talk about just what we do. So I run what's called a cancer biology and therapeutics lab, which is kind of, I, 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 I essentially consider myself a jack of all trades and a master of none. And essentially what I try to do is a set up an infrastructure to facilitate cancer research. You know, while we have a lot of activity in breast cancer, but we, 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 crack, we traverse across different uh, cancer types, but also outside the cancer space as well. So our interests are classically have been discovery using kind of advanced molecular profiling tools, gene expression profiling, proteomics to so find something interesting. Then we uh, focus on biomarker val validation, and we, for example, use uh, a technology called tissue microarray technology, where we take small pieces of tissue from many hundreds of uh, cancer, uh, cancer patients and put them onto a, a, a standard full face section block. We have a big activity using a viral system for, for functional interrogation, but also, which may be of more interest, we actually have uh, small animal imaging systems where we can actually look at tumor spread and dissemination. And one area that's actually particularly interesting for us is most of the tumor models out there, at mo uh, which are used for animal model studies, are not satisfactory because they don't, if you think about it, the tumor is not left in that person. It's actually uh, it's surgically resected. So the use of surgical resection is a very important uh, aspect of tumor model studies that is quite rarely used. So um, I'm just finishing off here. So as well as this program, so we're quite heavily embedded in a variety of different EU grants, which I, I've coordinated. I I'll just touch upon one of those called RATHER in the breast cancer space. And RATHER is actually quite a nice program because it's actually a, a collaboration of eight academic, uh, academic and industry partners around Europe, including some of the world heavy hitters in the breast cancer space. A guy called Carlos Caldas in Cambridge was published, I think, about 
20 nature level publications in the last three years. So he's really the top, one of the top people in the space. And a guy called Rennie Bernard, who uh, is in the Netherlands Cancer Institute. Again, a, a real top heavy hitter. And, it, and the focus of this program was really to look at two different subgroups of breast cancer. I've already discussed triple negative breast cancer. The other group that we focus on is invasive lobular carcinoma, about 10% of breast cancers. Pretty much a, rel a relatively understudied subgroup of breast cancer. And what we did, we focused specifically on those where we got 150 uh, invasive lobular breast cancer uh, cancers from both Cambridge and uh, Netherlands Cancer Institute, where we had long-term follow-up, and we essentially profiled those to death. We just threw everything at them, right? Where we looked at genetic alterations, protein expression alterations, copy number alterations, gene expression alterations, anything you consider at gene, RNA, and protein level to find novel uh, differences within those subgroups. Then we had a fairly uh, uh, sophisticated kind of bioinformatic approach to integrate that data. And then we had model systems to follow up. What's interesting is that this work, even though it was a five-year program, actually spawned a trial called Poseidon, which is an actual, uh, uh, now in phase two, where we're testing a novel uh, drug, a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Specifically, it's one of the world's first of a trial where uh, uh, essentially it's within this particular patient population of invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very nice uh, program. And just a bit of advertising. So Walter, who was a predece my predecessor in, uh, uh, who, uh, director of the Conway, he's director of a program called Systems Biology Ireland. And Walter is essentially an expert in understanding the inner com wire, kind of wiring within a cell. And so the whole idea is that this wiring goes wrong in cancer. And the idea is if you understand that wiring, can, you can interfere with it. And essentially what he's done is actually he's now gone on to, uh, he's in the kind of latter stages of submitting a, a grant application to Science Foundation Ireland called HSIS. And if that's successful, it will actually launch a, a very dramatic, a fantastic program to actually look at exploiting this approach across many different therapeutic areas. And so the program is actually just going in and uh, actually was it today or yesterday. <laughs> uh, if it's funded, I will come back and talk about it. And the last thing I want to mention, particularly for the younger people in the audience, we've just gotten funding under the Wellcome Trust for uh, essentially across UCD, well, UCD and the affiliated hospitals, for essentially uh, uh, a couple of different initiatives. But one is of particular interest, I think, to, to any early stage clinicians who want to actually get some kind of exposure to research. You know, again, not everybody should or is interested in doing research, but if you have any appetite to just see, see what it's like. We have this program uh, just will be launched in December, January, and uh, I'm heading it up. It's focused on personalized medicine and one health. And there, we'll have a specific scheme called a clinical primer scheme, where we'll fund about 50, give about 50 to 60,000 euro to fund up to a 12 month project, particularly for early stage clinicians, both human clinicians, but also we're looking uh, obviously in the vet school as well. But we're particularly looking for people who just as a taster, because as you know, there is this Welcome Trust PhD training program for clinician scientists, which has just been launched. They're really for more experienced people. So it's really to identify people, maybe more early stage, to just give them a flavor, potentially down the line. So I'd encourage people, if they're, if they're interested, uh, 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 please look at that program. Find someone you want to work in, in UCD and bid for that program. So that's it.